I don't stand side by side with nobody till I bleed with them first. What did we just see? You probably think this world is a dream come true. When I step into this ring, yeah, bro, I am addicted. Don't sleep on Luca. Maybe tomorrow we'll all wear 42. If you fight for your dreams, your dreams will fight for you. One of the age-old questions in the wrestling world is, who got you into wrestling? When people ask this question, they mainly are referring to the wrestlers themselves. What wrestler compelled you to get into wrestling, to want to watch more? A variation of this question is, who got you back into wrestling? When it comes to me, the answer can be various people as I've taken many breaks from wrestling in my life. In 2012 and 2013, it was Brian Danielson and his ascent to the mountaintop of WWE. When he got injured, I stopped watching wrestling for a bit but came back for a year because of Sami Zayn and NXT. From there, it was on and off with wrestling, catching bits and pieces from mainly NXT. In 2020, I again started watching wrestling, but it was only for the Rumble, TakeOver Portland, and WrestleMania. However, things changed for me right before WrestleMania that year. I've always known there were other promotions in the world. I knew a lot about different ones, but never fully got into them. Even with WWE, I could never get back into them fully and only watch the pay-per-views. But to return to the beginning questions, there's only one person who I can properly thank for not only bringing me back into wrestling, but introducing me to a whole new world of wrestling that eventually sparked me into truly getting back into wrestling. When I think back to the wrestling that always drew my interest the most in the days when I started getting back into wrestling, I think of two, tag team wrestling and women's wrestling. When I found out about NXT and started to get into it, the main thing at the time was Sami Zayn's climb, but the years that followed, my interest was mainly taken by the tag and women's scene. DIY, The Revival, American Alpha, The Undisputed Era, Grizzled Young Veterans, MSK, Asuka, Kyrie, Ember Moon, Bianca Belair, Rhea Ripley, Io Shirai, and many more. I bring this up because it was right before WrestleMania in 2020 that I was introduced to a wrestler that would fully ignite my love for wrestling. While many may get upset by my comment, I don't think it's too much of a hot take to say that WWE for a while has struggled a bit to fully capitalize on women's wrestling. They have plenty of stars and talent, but many times don't find the time for them. I share the same sentiment with AEW and the times that they only have one women's match a night. Another issue, which is quite frankly a personal one, but a lot of the top talent in these respective companies are also ones that I wasn't all too interested in. And the ones that I was interested in rarely got the time or opportunities. My point with all of this is that I was once again finding myself stuck in the same scenario of my interest in wrestling not peaking. Still not fully committed, I was almost looking at WrestleMania as the last shot. However, for whatever reason, the thought suddenly came to me that there are other promotions that I could try out, and I would later come to explore other companies like AEW and New Japan, but it really all started with one. As I sat there waiting for WrestleMania that Saturday, one company kept popping in my head, and to this day I can't even tell you where I remember hearing about them, but the one company, the one word that just kept popping up was stardom. Somewhere. I had heard of, of I, somewhere I had heard of various all women's promotions in Japan, and stardom was now the one stuck in my head. With hours to kill before WrestleMania, I went on YouTube to see what I could find and instantly found a match. Little did I know that this one match and this one very important woman would lead me to where I am today. So, the very first stardom match I ever watched involved a very special woman, known as. Hana Kimura. Hana Kimura was 22 years old at the time and had been wrestling for four years. She was a mainstay in stardom but made appearances for other companies as well. A notable accomplishment for Kimura was wrestling a dark match at the Tokyo Dome for New Japan Pro Wrestling's Wrestle Kingdom as a representative for stardom. I watched three matches of hers that day and instantly I was hooked. I wanted to seek out not only more of her work but more of stardom in general. But I'll save all that talk for the end. Before we get into her matches, let me give you a bit of backstory on Kimura. Kimura is a second generation wrestler. Her mother, Kyoko Kimura, 
also wrestled in stardom for a time, and the two teamed together in a trios match for Hana's first match in stardom. In 2015, Kyoko formed a villainous stable we now know today in stardom, Oedotai. Kyoko, along with fellow wrestlers Chris Wolf and Hudson Envy, joined forces with Ak Yazukawa, Dragonita, and Heidi Lovelace, now known as Ruby Soho, to form the group at Stardom's fourth anniversary event. In 2016, Kyoko would wrestle in a trios match, teaming with fellow Oedotai member and eventual successor as leader, Kagetsu. They would face off against Jungle Kiona, Momo Watanabe, and Mayu Iwatani. The two would reveal their mystery partner to be Kyoko's own daughter, Hana Kumura. The Kimuras and Kagetsu would get the win and use it to catapult themselves into a title shot against Three Dumb, which, if you don't know, was the trio consisting of Kairi Hojo, Mayu Iwatani, and Io Shirai. Three Dumb held Stardom's artist titles, their version of trio's titles, for 217 days and had previously beaten Kyoko and Kagetsu in that reign. Pretty tough competition to go against in only your second Stardom match, but the Kimuras and Kagetsu were able to pull it off. Later on, Kyoko would retire and Oedotai went through a rough patch. Hana was seemingly the only consistent member at times. Kagetsu later returned, assumed a leadership position, and from there, Oedotai went through a rebirth. Through Stardom's draft, they were able to get new additions to their stable. However, later on, around summer and fall of 2018, Kimura would turn on Kagetsu. Kimura would officially sign to Stardom in 2019, and during their draft, she would form her own unit known as Tokyo Cyber Squad. With her first pick, she would select Jungle Kiona. Kiona previously had her own faction, but it ended with the group disbanding. However, Kiona feels she can understand Kimura's way of life and will make the most of the opportunity. Following this, Kimura would take Konami, who she earned the respect of following their singles match. Mary Apache would be the next selected member, followed by Bobby Tyler, now known as Stevie Turner in NXT. My favorite part of the draft selection is how the crowd overall reacts to a lot of Kimura's picks and how it subtly tells the story of what this faction would come to be. And it's best exemplified when after picking Ruaka, Kimura notices Rina sitting on the stage crying. In response, she calls her Pink Baby and tells her to come on. The crowd is a bit shocked and Kimura simply states, She's like me. I'm not an extraordinary person. While there were a couple other members, the main seven were Jungle Kiona, Konami, Bobby Tyler, Ruaka, Rina, Kaori Yonyama, and their leader, Hana Kimura. Kimura was very key with her selections. She took Kiona, whose stable had failed, Konami, who was tired of her faction, relatively new, especially to stardom, Bobby Tyler, young Ruaka and Rina, and the established veteran Kaori. As they were always described, she took the misfits with the goal in mind of making them matter in the eyes of the company and the fans. As we would come to know their key phrase to be, everyone is different, everyone is special. She saw the good in all of them and was ready to take them with her on the road to stardom. Now that we have a little bit of backstory on Kimura and her ideology with her faction, how about we talk about some wrestling? Now, while I could recommend various matches, I decided it was best to simply talk about the three matches that I watched that fateful day that was enough to get me into stardom. Especially considering this means they're all available on YouTube for you to watch. I'll even go as far as to link them in the description for you. Our first match of the video is Kimura's bout on September 22nd, 2019 against Hazuki. The story of this match seemingly is both competitors taking their anger out on one another. Tensions are already high as it's a part of Stardom's 5-star Grand Prix tournament, but the added story is that Hazuki wants to beat Kimura for betraying Oedotai, and Kimura wants to beat her for taking her spot and rank in Oedotai. Along with this, both are obviously looking to win to advance in the tournament. The two begin their match simple, exchanging holds and grapples. Seems friendly to start, but things quickly ramp up as Hazuki first pulls Kimura down by her hair. Kimura proceeds to do the same to Hazuki and then begins to lay in the forearms, even as the ref asks her to stop. Despite Oedotai being the heel faction, Kimura really ups a lot of the heel antics in this match. As she lays in a knee to Hazuki on the ropes, the ref asks her to back off. Kimura responds by spitting at the ref. Hazuki and Kimura then begin to fight on the outside. Hazuki launches Kimura into the audience's chairs before walking her up the steps and smacking Kimura on the venue's west sign. She then takes her to the other side to hit her on the east side. Finally, the two make it back in the ring and Hazuki begins to lay in the kicks. 
Kimura finally gets back into things following a drop kick on Hazuki and then nails two kicks to Hazuki on the rope. It only gets a two, so Kimura tries to continue her offense, but Hazuki hits a backbreaker followed by a springboard drop kick and then puts Kimura in a crossface. Later, as Hazuki attempts to brain buster, Kimura is able to reverse it into a brutal submission move. Hazuki is only able to escape by getting her foot on the rope. I love the desperation in this spot from both women. Hazuki desperately trying to find any way to escape Kimura, and Kimura trying to grab Hazuki's leg to not only prevent the rope break but to fully lock in the submission. Hazuki hits a code breaker on Kimura when she is hung up on the ropes, but Kimura is able to move out of the way of the incoming kick. Kimura hits a big boot that only just gets a 2 and Kimura screams in frustration. She climbs the ropes and hits a big drop kick on Hazuki, followed by her lily bomb for the win. This win would give Kimura enough points to advance to the tournament finals. In the finals, Kimura would win, and this leads us to our next match. After winning the tournament, Kimura would go on to challenge Bea Priestley for Stardom's World of Stardom Championship at the end of the year. In the pre-match promo, Priestley would make the statement that Kimura was simply a little girl trying to step out of her mom's shadow. Kimura walks out with all her members there to support her for one of her biggest matches. As the bell rings, the two lock up and exchange holds. Afterwards, Kimura offers a handshake to Priestley. Priestley proceeds to flick her off and tell her F you. Kimura feels insulted but still insists they shake hands. As Priestley goes to comply, Kimura spits in her face, flicks her off with both fingers and tells her F you. Priestley does the exact same thing back and the gloves are completely off for this match. The two fight on the outside and Kimura is able to trap Priestley in the ring apron. As the Tokyo Cyber Squad members distract the ref, Kimura hits Priestley with a chair. She then launches Priestley into the audience's chairs and hits her with a fan's umbrella. After getting her inside to break the count, Kimura again launches Priestley into the chairs and drags her up the steps to repeatedly hit her on the building's pillars. After taking quite a bit of offense, Priestley tries to work her way back. This starts the process of her working on Kimura's arm. Kicks, trapping in the ropes, along with various submissions, Priestley wants to punish Kimura. But... Kimura continues to fight. However, it's not long before Priestley gets her in a submission that really tests her pain tolerance. She traps and wrenches the arm, all while in the middle of the ring. Cheered on by her members, Kimura desperately crawls enough to get her foot on the rope to break the count. Priestley continues the attack, but it's her mocking of Kimura that opens the window for Kimura's comeback. She hits a huge suplex, followed by three kicks, but it only gets a two count. Kimura attempts her own submission, but Priestley is able to reverse it. Priestley gets a chokehold in, and Kimura slowly begins to fade. We see a slight move of the hand, but it looks like she might be done. She is only just able to get her foot on the rope at the last second. Kimura still has fight as she gets a quick roll-up, but it's still not enough. Priestley holds the advantage and capitalizes by hitting the foot stomp to Kimura hung up on the middle rope. Both women fall hard to the outside. Kimura is only able to get back in the ring at 18, but is immediately met with a kick from Priestley. Somehow though, Kimura is able to kick out. As Priestley attempts her move, Kimura desperately clings to the ropes. As Priestley climbs the ropes, Kimura recovers from the previous super kick and fights back Priestley's offense. Kimura lays in the forearms, nails a headbutt, and hits a huge suplex off the top rope. It only gets a 2, but Kimura wastes no time locking in her signature submission. Priestley gets a foot on the rope to escape, so Kimura just continues her offense, trying not to take her foot off the gas. She hits a drop kick off the top rope and then attempts her lily bomb. Priestley fights out of it, but Kimura then hits a huge German suplex where Priestley nearly lands on her head. Priestley just barely muscles out a kick out, escapes another lily bomb attempt, and then hits a huge knee on Kimura. She breaks the count by grabbing the rope at the last second. Priestley hits a huge suplex that looks to finish the match, except Kimura kicks out of it at 1 and is already on her feet while Priestley is still in shock. The two attempt to hit each other with knees, but Priestley connects first. She hits another knee before pulling down her knee pad and hitting Kimura with another one in the corner. Kimura, dazed, can do nothing as Priestley lifts her up for her finisher. Despite her very best efforts at the end, it is not enough for Kimura to capture the World of Stardom Championship. All she can do is be proud of her efforts and taking the champion to the limit. Finally, we arrive at our final match. Our final match is actually the first ever match from Stardom that I watched. As I said at the beginning, Hana Kimura was a part of the first Stardom match I watched. 
I watched a match before WrestleMania, and I remember feeling like I should have waited because nothing could compare afterwards. The first match I ever watched is a bittersweet one because as you watch it, you just know Kimura was destined to be a star, and this rivalry was going to define herself and stardom for years to come. My first ever stardom match was Hana Kimura versus Julia on December 24th, 2019 at Stardom's year-end climax. It was their only singles match to date, and it was a damn good one if I say so myself. In the pre-match promo, Kimura calls the match a match of faith. The two are finally going to face off one-on-one. -on -one. As you'll see with the YouTube version, despite the language barrier, the message of this feud is pretty clear. The two competitors do not like each other one bit. When the two were in the ring after Julia called Kimura out, a fight broke out. Julia hit Kimura with a strike, which then prompted Kimura to spit in her face and lay in her own strikes. The two are seen battling outside the venue and have to be separated. Backstage, they are seen grabbing at each other's hair, yelling at each other. Kimura finishes her pre-match promo saying she's going to destroy Julia's face. The two make their entrances and already get in each other's face. The ref has to separate the two and send them to their respective corners. The animosity is there from the start. As the bell rings, the two charge at each other with forearm strikes to the cheers of the crowd. Kimura gets Julia down first and rains the forearm strikes. She then tries to get an arm lock in, but Julia then gets on top and starts to lay in punches. She has to be warned by the ref multiple times for attempting close-fisted punches. Kimura gets to the ropes to avoid the submission, and then she again spits in Julia's face and hits her with a huge slap. Julia hits a big kick and decides she's going to make Kimura pay. This time, it's Kimura getting thrown into the chairs, getting hit with a chair, and then being led up the stairs to be thrown at the east sign. Julia then nearly lands a chair shot to Kimura's head. As the two fight in the crowd, you consistently hear the ring announcer not only count, but plead for the two to get back in the ring. The two eventually get in, only for Julia to take her back out. She slams Kimura on the outside and attempts a huge running knee. However, Kimura nails her with a chair and patiently recovers back in the ring. They continue back and forth with Julia attempting a submission, but Kimura is able to crawl to the ropes. She then hits a big drop kick on Julia, followed by a delayed suplex. Kimura then repeatedly kicks Julia in the head, which angers her to then repeatedly slap Kimura. The two then begin to choke each other and grab at each other's hair. The two then exchange headbutts, followed by the two hitting headbutts to each other at the same time, causing both to fall. The two get up, and then the kicking resumes once again. Back and forth, the two go before Julia snatches Kimura into a submission. Kimura once again escapes via rope break. It's now Julia's turn to be put into a submission, and she arguably has it worse, as Kimura continues to twist and turn Julia. Julia escapes via rope break, but is still vulnerable to Kimura's kicks. Kimura climbs the ropes and hits a drop kick onto Julia. She then drags Julia to the middle of the ring and almost lands a lily bomb, but Julia wiggles out and rolls Kimura up. No matter what each woman does though, the other seems to have a way out. Kimura hits another headbutt and locks Julia in her patent submission. Again though, Julia is able to break out via rope break. Kimura tries the lily bomb, but Julia escapes. Julia tries pile driver, but Kimura gets a foot on the rope. Frustration growing, Julia locks Kimura in one last submission, right in the middle of the ring. Anytime Kimura tries to crawl away, she keeps it locked in. And it's the final moments of this match that I love so very much and made me realize I needed more. The bell rings, and it's a time limit draw between the two. Kimura nearly passed out after the submission, and yet, once Julia grabs at her hair, she instantly starts grabbing at Julia's hair too, even though she's not fully conscious. The two literally have to be pulled apart by the ringside wrestlers. Julia slams the mat in frustration that she couldn't beat Kimura, and yet, the two of them show respect to one another at the very end. In the post-match promo, Julia says that there will be more in 2020, and the two of them aren't done. If only that could have been true. We've reached the end of our video, and I don't want to end the video on a sad note, but I think it's time we address the elephant in the room, especially after the last match and what I said at the end. Sadly, Hana Kimura passed away May 23rd, 2020. Three years ago for us today in the U.S. 
She was featured on a TV series and one of the episodes must have upset a lot of viewers. They turned to social media and began to attack her for something so pointless and minuscule. Kimura would later make one final post on her Instagram before taking her own life. Her mother to this very day is still seeking justice for her daughter and still throws on a yearly event to continue her legacy. She was 22 years old with a whole career ahead of her. Her connection with the crowd is unlike any I had seen before. All she wanted from wrestling was to grow it and spread it to a wider audience. And thankfully today, we can say she has done exactly that. She may not be here with us anymore, but she continues to live on. Before her injury, Jungle Kiona was spreading women's wrestling to pro wrestling Noah. Stardom had one of their biggest shows to date back in April. Mercedes Monet not only paid tribute to Hanukkah with one of her gears, but has been helping spread Japanese women's wrestling to a global audience. Many of the wrestlers continue to carry Hana with them, none more than Julia, who surely knows that their careers were going to be tied together for this entirety. She may have only had four years in wrestling, but she damn sure left a hell of a legacy behind that is carried each day by her generation. While others bring up her name in ill fashion, I choose to make a video like this today to remind you all that she was greater than her death. She was a star with endless potential. She was a wrestler with a great catalog of matches and rivalries. And most importantly, she was a one of a kind person who simply wanted everyone to be involved in this crazy wonderful world of wrestling. Thank you, Hana. We miss you and your presence every day. I'm grateful to have watched you in your matches. Without you, I wouldn't be here today covering the sport I now love the most. Thank you for being a fighter. Thank you for being you.